Welcome everyone to our Saturday morning plenary session. And this includes a welcome to those of you joining us online courtesy of the HowlRound TV streaming service. Our committee and the APAP staff refer to today's event as the Pasha Kasha session, which has fast become a well-known format for making presentations. A traditional Pasha Kasha format means the presenter uses 20 slides that automatically advance every 20 seconds, so the presentation is exactly 6 minutes and 40 seconds. But here at APAP NYC, we have invited artists to make the presentations and allow for a creative approach that can include video and or live performance. But each presentation is still timed out to be not more than seven minutes. And we have quite an exciting lineup for you. Here is Daniel to introduce today's moderator so we can get started. Thank you, Rachel. And I also thank you for all being with us at today's plenary. Our moderator for today's event is both an artist and a presenter. He is a national artistic director, including the seven-part HBO documentary, Russell Simmons Presents Brave New Voices. He is an inaugural recipient of the United States Artist Rockefeller Fellowship which annually recognizes 50 of our country's great 2011 Alpert Award winner in theater and named to the inaugural class of Doris Duke Artist in 2012. He has just completed a Balinese-style shadow play that examines global economies and sexual identities through the lens of soccer's World Cup. Yes, as you can see, he is certainly a multitasker, while at the same time, arts at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming today's moderator, Mr. Mark Bamuti Joseph. Hi. How are we doing? Uh, this is Jerry. Um, hey, Jerry. The reason why Jerry is up here is because we're live streaming and my daughter is watching. So, see. Um, Jerry's not going to be sitting here the whole time, but maybe just we'll kick it right here. All right, cool. Yeah, Jerry rolled. So. <laughs> It is a pleasure to be here in your extraordinary uh, presence. You are about to meet some incredible artists. As uh, Rachel indicated, each of the speakers has prepared a presentation. Artists, what they draw upon for inspiration and how they think about their creative work in terms of audience engagement. And their story does indeed need to be told within seven minutes. Uh, as you might suspect, this is not an easy task, but fortunately, each has had the benefit of guidance from Alicia Anstead. Give it up for her. <laughs> Alicia is an arts and culture reporter, educator, and happens to be the longtime editor of APAP's Inside Arts magazine. Thank you again, Alicia, for your invaluable assistance. Um, so now we'll hear from each of our five speakers, if that's cool with y'all. Cool with y'all? Great. Um, following um, hearing from the speakers, I'll moderate a conversation. Maybe thinking about questions, thoughts, ideas that you might like to share during our discussion period following the presentations. Cool? Cool? Sweet. Our first speaker has uh, enjoyed a varied career as both an actor and a musician. His Broadway credits include Inherit the Wind, Ring of Fire, uh, the Civil War and the Will Rogers Follies, plus appearances at Carnegie Hall and many other venues in the UK and Europe. Born and raised in Texas, he drew upon his interest in what he says based on the life and songs of Woody Guthrie. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Lutkin to the stage. Howdy. <clears throat> I'm David Lutkin. Thank you all for coming. Let's go. <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson Guthrie. 
And uh, he grew up in Oklahoma, and he became America's greatest ballad song maker, according to John Steinbeck. And I began uh, 12 years ago to develop uh, a couple of shows about him with my wonderful collaborators there, Helen Russell, Andy Tierstein, Nick Corley, and Darcy DeVille. And uh, in the process of doing these shows over the last 12 years, uh, we debuted in, uh, in London in uh, 2011. But before that, we had done many children's shows and grown-up shows all over the world. After the show is over, we have a hootenanny. And uh, that's the togetherness part of our show, I guess, uh, to the nth degree, trying to teach and uh, to encourage activity and engagement from our audience. Uh, here we are in, in Harlem a few years back. We've been to, with various casts, we've been to uh, Florida and, and uh, Oklahoma, and, and as I say, we've been uh, all over Europe as well. And the hootenanny aspect of the show and the teaching aspect has become a very important part of this for me, moving from the children's show, which came first, to the grown-up show, Woody Says, which has been touring for the last seven years, and teaching the children about the music and in listening to what they have to say about what they've learned and in teaching them to use some of these instruments and where the instruments come from. Now, uh, we certainly run into our problems, uh, just like you do here in New York. We were stuck uh, in uh, snowdrift in Austria for quite some time, uh, but we got out of it and uh, managed to uh, finish up there and had a great time. We've, this is a great example of, uh, of some of the places we've played 89 cities in uh, over 10 countries, if you include Oklahoma. And uh, <clears throat> teaching these students, particularly in Europe, was fascinating. Teaching that young fellow to play the banjo a little bit at the Hootenanny afterwards, one of his teachers walked up and said, young man, are you responsible for this? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, I want you to know you've done more for your country in the last 45 minutes than your government has done in the last 45 years. I was very flattered by that. I appreciated it very much. And uh, we do our best to continue with that. And it's not only the material in the show, which of course Woody Guthrie was the great famous balladeer for the common man, as we all know, but it's also what happens in the show outside the show uh, because of our efforts to engage people. For, the, uh, for Woody's centennial, uh, we went to Germany and uh, played over there, we did the show over there. We also played with uh, several other bands in celebration of, of Woody's life and his music. We played there with, uh, with Tom Morello from uh, Rage Against the Machine. And uh, he was at that time, of course, uh, 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 very important in the, uh, in the Occupy movement, which I'm sure Woody would have participated in as well. The Occupy movement uh, was a little more subdued uh, for the Festival of Music and Politics in uh, what used to be East Berlin. This was a panel. Uh, for that, but at our concert in uh, a festival in Rudolstadt, uh, we had done the show and we got up to play in front of a huge crowd of 2,000 people and they listened very sweetly until the very end when we sang This Land is Your Land and they all stood up to sing along with us. We sang uh, in the streets of Belfast uh, on both sides of the Peace Wall and uh, had a great time there both with the show and with our hootenannies. And we've been to all kinds of interesting places, and sometimes we don't even play. We just listen. When we went to, uh, to Israel in 2013, I tried to arrange with several theaters in the, in the West Bank and the Palestinian territories to play there, but because of the BDS movement, we were not allowed. And so instead of a boycott, I decided to become involved in what I'm calling an Epcot, which is that we went there to listen to them. And we went to Al Rawad, which is a school in uh, a refugee camp in Bethlehem, and we listened to them play. And we had our hootenannies there. And Woody Guthrie said, I'll give you a little bit here. He said, I hate a song that makes you think you're not any good. I hate a song that makes you think you're just born to lose, bound to lose, no good to nobody, no good for nothing, because you're too old, or too young, or too fat, or too thin, or too this, or too that. Songs that run you down because of your hard luck and your hard travel. And I'm out to fight those kind of songs to my very last breath and my last drop of blood. I'm out to sing songs that will make you believe that this is your world, make you take pride in yourself and in your work. And the songs that I sing are made up for the most part by all sorts of folks just about like you. We played in the, the tent city in Tel Aviv that was being dismantled by the Israeli government. And then with rabbis for human rights, we went to the Negev desert and played at a protest at a crossroads, that, at a stoplight 
where the cars would drive up and we would play, we shall not be moved, and that was, and then they drove on. But Sheikh Sayak there was our, our uh, ally in that. And we had a wonderful time there playing and listening, just as we did in China when we went uh, with uh, Jennifer Tarlin, who was a wonderful uh, organizer from uh, the American Culture Center at the University of Shanghai. And we played Shanghai, Nanjing, and uh, at uh, East China Normal University. Each of our programs there was uh, a three-day affair. We would have a show, and then in the shadow of the statue of Mao Zedong there, we had uh, a hoot nanny, and then uh, where they, you can see, they played our instruments, we played their instruments, and it was fascinating and fabulous. They, we even got them to dance for us. It was great to uh, You Are My Sunshine. It was pretty special. I, I think I'm a little jet lagged in, in that picture uh, there. But uh, <clears throat> our performances there were, were fabulous and our question and answer periods were amazing. When we started talking in the show about World War II and they asked after the show was over, what was World War II? And we had an opportunity to talk about that and to listen to what they had to say about the period between 1932 and 1952 when China was engaged in what it was engaged in. What he says has been all over the world and we continue, I hope, to uh, participate together with our audiences all over the world. We're headed for uh, back to the West Bank, as a matter of fact, in two weeks. And uh, we'll be doing the show there for children. And uh, I bought 200 harmonicas the other day to take over there. To, uh, to hand out during the Hootenannies. And as long as we can keep hooting, then uh, we'll keep going. And uh, this is a shot in London where uh, our Hootenannies became almost as big as the show every week. And we had a wonderful time, and I'm having a great time here today listening to what everybody else is gonna have to say. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Wow, just off top. So uh, when I was um, a, a wee lad playing uh, soccer, you know, uh, I'd, on my way to the game, I'd put my headphones on, I'd listen to Public Enemy or um, NWA, I'd be mad, I'd be ready to thrash and, you know, just hyper. Um, but I wish I'd been listening to David <laughs> because I'm just as inspired and just as wild up. I wanna, you know, do more for my country. Seriously, and the planet. Thank you, thank you. So um, this is what we'll be hearing um, and experiencing uh, all afternoon long. Um, our next speaker is an award-winning artist from our neighbor to the north. That is not Connecticut, that is Canada. Um, she is from the, uh, the South Coast is usually described as an Inuit throat singer, a style which well matches her talent with her commitment to protect and value the cultural roots of her native land. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the winner of Canada's 2014 Polaris Music Prize for the album Animism. This is Tanya Tagak. Um, okay. Let's let her rip. This is my mother and her sister. She was born and raised in an igloo about 300 miles from the magnetic North Pole. She now has a degree from McGill University, her B.Ed. That is how quickly our culture has managed to change in one generation. This is my daughter and I hanging out in minus 55 degrees Celsius. So I don't want to hear any more complaining about the cold. <laughs> None! <laughs> yes, uh, where I'm from, Nunavut, is a landmass of around 92 million square kilometers with only 34,000 people living there. We're completely isolated. This is a qamatiq. This is a, one of our traditional ways of traveling. Originally, it was uh, made by whale, whale bones and pulled by dog team. So being so isolated up there, <clears throat> we can only get uh, southern foods flown in by jet. And quite often that means that uh, you're buying wilted brown $16 batches of grapes. So we are very accustomed to getting our food off of the land, which was of course a meat-based diet. This is lunch. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, the intimacy and love between uh, hunter and hunted, the ability to survive in such a harsh environment, the closeness with nature, often makes me wonder about how the survival skills in a place like New York City and the survivor th survival skills in a place like Nunavut, how they coincide. How do we become, begin to work together in our ideas on how we live together on this planet when in, in such a beautiful earth, it's so many different cultures that are expected to be brought together. This is what it looks like in the summertime up there. It's, way, it's very far past the tree line. This is my father and my little daughter. We have animals that migrate all the way from Mexico to come up to, for the summertime. I know this image might seem disgusting to you guys, but to me it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The way that life can be taken and can be given, and the respect between the two. I hope that the relationship you have between your meat is maybe as respectful. This is my child. I posted this picture because uh, we were at an elders camp, and I thought how beautiful to, to show that it's okay to touch your meat. It's okay to understand where it comes from, and this is the hate that came from it. Animal rights activists attacked our family for about three months straight, including photoshopping my baby being killed, including death threats. And this is what I'm interested in and why I'm speaking. How do we build a bridge in the likes of togetherness? How do we look at each other and respect each other when our values are so different? I think one of the things we can look at as humans with common denominators breath, our, our will to survive, our ability to feel anger, pain, you know, our joy, our love, our heartbreak, and most importantly, our empathy. How we all give birth, how we all came from a, from a womb, how we all came from a woman, how we all work together to become who we are. This is a painting I did um, this is a young Inuk girl throwing up Christianity. <laughs> Christianity was forced upon us um, a long time ago by colonialists. And this is what's very important that I'm trying to discuss when it comes to genocide, human rights, and how we become together. This is an old legend we had about shape-shifting. And this is part of why there is a disconnect with where you get your luncheon meat. We as humans have decided we're more important than other creatures on the planet. We're supposedly more important than the land, which isn't true. The earth owns us. We go back into her. This is a list of the missing and murdered women in Canada, indigenous women. Since 1980, there's been almost 1,200 the, our Prime Minister is refusing an inquiry into looking into the social phenomenon that is a direct result of colonialization. This is what I'm singing about. This is what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that with this bridge I make that we can take empathy and we can work together to take these statistics down. My daughters are four times more likely to be murdered than any other uh, racial demographic in Canada. This is a crisis as far as I'm concerned. This is why I'm singing. This is very important for us that we learn how to communicate in a positive way. Sorry, it's so important to me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little, it's a little um, overwhelming. <laughs> so, thank you. I realize that this occurs everywhere. How do we build these bridges? How do we not be afraid of each other anymore? It's through breath. It's through opening. And it's through understanding. And it's through love. So I'm hoping that listening to this little talk, you can understand that your lunch and meat used to walk around. 
<laughs> and that we have uh, plights in humanity that are desperate for attention and can be addressed in a completely open and loving way. Um, this is a caribou and I want to eat it. <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> Awesome. You can eat anything you want. You can't touch Jerry. <laughs> FYI. <sighs> yeah, it's a good thing these people aren't um, passionate because um, we will now hear from a fellow presenter and curator who began his career in radio in Istanbul. Um, and after moving to New York, has become quite well known for his creative and customized skills as a festival curator and tour producer. He is co-founder of the New York Gypsy Festival and is also on the faculty of NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, please welcome Mehmet Dede. Good afternoon. Let's roll. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a, uh, my name is Mehmet Dede. I'm an art presenter, tour producer, and educator uh, living in New York City. In the past 10 years, I've had the pleasure of presenting literally hundreds of shows with artists from Africa to Europe, from South America to the American South and beyond. To say that I truly love music is probably an understatement. I try to live it every day. I started out in the business as an independent promoter, putting on shows at music venues as well as non-traditional places like rooftops and our club, Drome, on the Lower East Side, where I do most of my presenting nowadays. And a lot of the pictures you will see are actually pictures from the shows that I've had the pleasure of presenting in the past 10 years. In 2008, I had a profound um, uh, ex experience uh, when I did my yoga training um, with an Indian school and that training really was um, had a large impact in the sense that I met a tantric priest and he said that uh, my experience in life would be to connect people this is a picture from those um, days uh, when I was doing my training and he said that my mission in life my purpose in life is really to connect people and I took that really to heart and I try to apply that to my um, work every single day the, uh, the following picture is um, a picture from South by Southwest. You can feel the energy in this picture. I really love this picture because it was open air, uh, hundreds of people at a small venue in Austin, Texas with a rock band. The energy was high. And um, I was striving for something that had that kind of like connection, that had the ability to really transcend people, especially the creative artists and the audience that they engaged in. This is a picture from Marjan Dede and the Secret Tribe show that I did last year at the World Financial Center. Uh, to me, that connection is spiritual, and this uh, picture really explains it. Um, also, the juxtaposition of um, spiritual music in the heart of Wall Street was an interesting one, and I strive to create those kind of themes in my art when I present music. So how exactly do I present this music? I pay special attention to the environment. The environment is extremely important for me. Is this show open air? Is it indoors? Is it seated? Is it standing room? What kind of audiences are coming to this show? These are all important themes that I look at before booking the artist, and sometimes vice versa. I book the venue based on the artist, so it can go either way. I look for creative conversations in my uh, shows. I try to make sure that the artist um, creates the conversation, that they engage with the audience, and the audience also create that, are part of that conversation, and is actually uh, discussing amongst themselves the themes that the artist is presenting. What can artists do in this uh, sort of like um, uh, uh, setup? Well, they have a lot of commitment, and they have a lot of responsibilities already on their shoulders, not, on, not to mention their heads. And uh, for me, it's quite important that the artist understands um, um, that touring and performing is a physically straining job, and that they're committed to what they're doing, because I certainly am as a presenter. Team building is important. Um, I work with many different presenters, colleagues, labels, agents, uh, managers over the course of my career, and I'm really indebted to all of them because I'm here today because of their help and because what we created together. This is, uh, the next uh, slide is a collaboration um, from a show that I did in 2009 in Brooklyn between Indian Bhangra artist Red Bharat and Brazilian band Nation Beat. 
In 2012, I started to teach at NYU, and that really had a big impact on me as well, because I started to listen in a different way. Um, for me, the most important thing is really engagement, uh, collaboration, connection. These things start because it's a two-way street. It's never a one-way street. This is my uh, graduating students from last year. Um, the NYU experience really taught me um, to understand language and to listen, and also enhanced my skills in presenting art. Listening to fans and community engagement is a big part of what I do as part of my job, and I want to make sure that the artists that I work with are engaged in their communities. This is Delhi from uh, Delhi to Dublin from Canada, uh, doing a show at Drum. Ten years ago, for this reason, I started a festival called the New York Gypsy Festival. My goal was to introduce artists with Romani roots um, and present them in the American market, especially. America and Canada, North American market, because I felt that those genres were underrepresented and there was a need to actually understand them and listen to them. Uh, I was able to work with over 100 artists in the past 10 years uh, from Eastern Europe, India, North Africa, the Middle East, artists who weren't necessarily Romani themselves but were inspired by the Romani culture. This is a show from 2010 that I did at Central Park Summer Stage. Um, with uh, this band is from Ukraine called Teishu Banda. The Black Sea Roma Festival brought together different artists from the Black Sea region and put them together on one bill. And in fact, uh, the headliner that night was Selim Sesler, who is known as the Coltrane of the clarinet from Turkey, passed away a few months after this performance. And I felt that musical connection that I created, um, that I had lost it for a minute. But Later on, as I reflected onto it, it was actually there, and it will be there because of that kind of connection that we had created that day. Um, three years ago, I got involved with 12 crazy gypsies from a small, tiny village in Romania called Fanfara Shokarlia, extremely humorous and fun band to work with. Um, imagine myself being on tour with these guys for three weeks, 12 crazy gypsies who little speak English, but our connection was so deep, and I feel that we are part of a larger family now. This was our routing, uh, starting in Montreal, going down to the Midwest, East Coast, West Coast, and up back to Canada. Uh, 20 shows in 21 days during July. Uh, to say that it was an intense tour is, would be probably an understatement. Uh, we were able to create this project um, because we had funding from the Romanian Cultural Institute. We ran a Kickstarter uh, campaign. We had amazing support from the community. and. This tour came together because of the involvement of the fans, and this is precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, this shot is from uh, last year's Pace University show. After the show ended on the main stage, the band didn't really care. They wanted to continue the party in the lounge area. Um, the band has become my family, really. I truly have become uh, a better person and matured because of them. Um, and this is probably the best example that anyone can give when we talk about the, the potential of being together. Thank you so much for your attention today. So good. Uh, 20 shows in 21 days in July. Sometimes I just want July to have 15 days. Uh, you have probably noticed in your program that one of today's speakers was to have been Dr. Ahmad Sarmas. Dr. Sarmas was invited to share with us his incredible journey as founder and director of the Afghanistan School of Music. Unfortunately, Dr. Samast was injured in Kabul last month during a suicide bombing in the auditorium where his students were performing. Uh, we at APAP are pleased to report that although he suffered severe injuries, none are life-threatening, and he's receiving good care by medical professionals and family. Uh, we've extended our best wishes for a full recovery, and we know that we'll have him at next year's conference. Uh, in the place of Dr. Samast, uh, we have with us today an extraordinary actor and playwright who shares his vision to affirm the positive cultural identity and contributions of our global neighbors in and from the Middle East. Uh, she is best known as the solo performer and writer of the award-winning off-Broadway hit, Nine Parts of Desire, uh, which details the lives of nine Iraqi women. She currently appears in the film Vino Veritas, which had its premiere at the Soho International Film Festival, and she wrote the libretto for a new opera in development entitled Fallujah, the first opera on the Iraq War. Uh, my friends, please welcome Heather Raffo to the stage. Uh, 
Thank you. Let's roll. I carry a story of a six-year-old Iraqi girl sold as a bride for ISIS, a story told to me by a young Iraqi doctor who buys as many girls as she can, hoping to smuggle them out of the country. I asked her, how can people be so violent? She asked me, after violence, how are people still so capable of love? This genocide is personal to me. I'm a blonde American born and raised in Michigan. My father is Iraqi Christian born and raised in Mosul. And every church his grandfather's carved from marble, every house graffitied with the Christian letter N. Communities thousands of years old are being wiped out as we speak. So the story I'm writing is the story of a young Iraqi girl adept at the only thing her parents believed in quantum physics. Like an acrobat, her mind flees through parallel worlds, through ancient caliphates and tolerant empires, because if you're an Iraqi girl today, the only escape is another universe. I grew up in Michigan, but spent my time dreaming of other worlds, being an artist, an actress, studied at RADA, got my MFA from the Old Globe, knowing only Shakespeare would satisfy a strong-willed girl born to be 50 and fierce. But when another war broke out with Iraq and Shakespeare's plays spoke for this universal war experience, I knew they didn't speak for me. I searched for any contemporary drama with a Middle Eastern female voice. It did not exist. So I began to write. My inspiration, the Iraqi artist Leila Attar. Nine Parts of Desire was the first play in the English language with an Iraqi female protagonist. It catapulted me into conversations from the Kennedy Center to the US Islamic World Forum. After a show in DC, a six foot tall man from the Pentagon sobbed in my arms. Behind him, an Iraqi immigrant with her daughter. The play exposes boldly the passions and pursuits of nine ordinary and very extraordinary Iraqi women. Their context is war, but their desire is their need for life. I have the joy of telling Iraqi women a play about them was a commercial success. Running off Broadway for nine months, performed at nearly every major regional theater, and beginning a global conversation that has not slowed down for 10 years. It's currently on stage in Hungary, in India, and in Virginia. When Arab women find it, they read it aloud to their mothers. Soldiers share it with fellow soldiers. College and high school students write me, unburdening themselves of thoughts they didn't even know could be said aloud. The New Yorker called it an example of how art can remake the world and eloquently name pain. So what is our artistic and social responsibility to catharsis? Where else but in the performing arts can we still have a transformative experience sitting next to a stranger, a stranger different in political and spiritual beliefs? To have been a bridge for the Middle Eastern female voice to come onto main stages and into conversations, I'm reminded the theater is probably the only world where I can exist. When I was four years old, I slept on the roof of my grandmother's house in Baghdad. I rode roller coasters in the park. I have spent every decade of my life bridging Iraq and America, transforming the unfathomable conversations into arias. I've written an opera inspired by a Marine who's had five suicide attempts since returning from Fallujah. After a performance at Kennedy Center, Marines stayed long after to share experiences even their families had never heard. A woman from the Department of Defense was hungry to bring the opera to her workplace. Now, why would an opera be needed by a military community? Can song move those spaces created by violence and loss? And how necessary is catharsis? Are the performing arts the only place it's happening? I'm working with a group of Arab American women in Queens who, like Nora in a doll's house, are waking up to find they aren't being themselves even at home. So embedded with them, I'm adapting A Doll's House, telling the story of Noura, living in post-revolutionary Egypt. She's been awakened, as her country has, with a new voice of self-awareness. But her day-to-day -day is an increasingly repressive reality. From the Middle East to Queens, in risking giving voice to a community, I find I'm actually creating a community full of people hungry to be part of a movement against what would believe a make us believe we're not all in this together. 
I believe art holds our cultural memory. But in this last decade, I've begun to wonder if it might be one of those last institutions able to hold inclusiveness and uplift the human condition. See, I need the theater to address the magical and the unspeakable. Through the many women of nine parts, through a Marine singing in the arms of his brothers, through Nora, a revolutionary mother and wife, through an Iraqi girl dancing in a parallel universe, through a genocide that has now come home to me, I ask, how can we be so violent? How are we still so capable of love? And how can we bridge these deeply human divides? Thank you. Wow. Wow. Um, has anybody ever uh, used this format? Anybody in this room? It's fucking hard, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I cannot believe. Oh, sorry, Nanea. <laughs> okay. It's hard. It's very hard. It's mad hard. It's hella hard. It's hecka hard. <laughs> Um, but uh, these incredible artists, uh, my lord, have um, attacked it with such passion and intellect and um, tenderness around inquiry. So thank all of you, truly. Um, our final speaker. Uh, with our final speaker, we return to the world of dance. Uh, a director, choreographer, performer originally from Montreal. She first received recognition as a celebrated principal dancer for the Bill T. Jones Arne Zane Dance Company. Over the length of her career to date, she has choreographed for stage, theater, and film, and developed a reputation for her deep sensitivity and approach to working with unconventional dancers. In one, she and her company, Heidi Latsky Dance, are credited by critics and audiences as innovators, pioneers, and visionaries whose work does not ask why, but rather why not. Uh, friends, please welcome Heidi Latsky. Okay, I can begin. Heidi Latsky's GIMP which includes dancers who are disabled, is one of those ideas that arrive as visionary, only to soon inspire the question, why not? I love this quote from Sid Smith's review from the Chicago Tribune of my first evening length, physically integrated work, GIMP. But it's the why not that resonates with me particularly, and it has throughout my life because of the seemingly counterintuitive choices I've made along the way. Like, why not take up dance when I just graduated with a psychology degree at the age of 19, fell in love with disco, saw the movie Turning Point, and realized that I didn't want to regret not doing something that I really wanted to do. So then why not go to New York City from Canada to pursue a career, even though I had been told that I was too old and too short. Why not audition for Broadway, only to find myself in the Bill T. Jones Arne Zane Dance Company because I was so not a triple threat. And then why not, as I stand here in front of you today, continue dancing at the age of 56? When I started dancing, my ideal dancer was tall, thin, and had legs that went on forever. Thankfully, thankfully this misguided belief was under the influence of Bill and Arnie was dispelled. At my first rehearsal, I encountered Lawrence Goldhuber, who, because of his large size, I immediately assumed was the stage manager, until Bill instructed me to literally climb all over him. I couldn't wrap my head around Larry as a dancer, and then came my aha moment, when I really recognized the true beauty and the power of his presence in the company. 
So much so that years later, Larry and I formed, there we are, um, our own duet company, and we were considered, quote, unquote, the Laurel and Hardy of modern dance. Bill would often say that something was too beautiful, too easy, too conventional, and I started to understand the beauty of the unconventional. Visual artist Lisa Bufano, as Lisa, was one such influence in my life. Jeremy Allager, founder of the Boston Dance Umbrella, introduced us after years of telling me about his wheelchair festivals and years of being, me being not interested at all. Lisa was not your typical dancer. She was not a trained dancer. She was a bilateral amputee whose fierceness and vulnerability permeated her entire being. I still can't believe that at our first meeting, which was for lunch, that it wasn't until I was just about to enter the restaurant that it dawned on me that I was having lunch with somebody without fingers. And I had questions. What do I say to her? Do I look at her hands? Do I talk about her disability? And then in rehearsal, there were even more questions. How to be politically correct? How to not offend her? What's the right thing to say? How do I push her hard, but not too hard? I had never been around people with disabilities before, and I was really curious, but really terrified, and specifically afraid of saying the right, wrong things, and also not being able to honor her uniqueness and her beauty. On the other hand, it was really easy to do that. When I wasn't second guessing myself, and when we were in the rehearsal studio together, I really, I found myself, I saw what she had, not what she didn't have, to the point where, with Lisa, I, I said, please remove your prosthetics, because I felt that I could more easily access and more fully access her full movement potential. What I didn't know was that, months later, she told me that that was a very emotionally challenging act for her. Um, I had found my muse in the most unlikely of places, and it changed me profoundly. After the Judson Church premiere of my solo for Lisa titled Five Open Mouths, Lisa looked at us. She got a standing ovation, a well-deserved standing ovation, and she looked at Jeremy and I and questioned, are they applauding me because I'm disabled, or are they applauding me because I dance beautifully? Jeremy, in his infinite wisdom, replied, both. So where does beauty reside? Is it truly in the eyes of the beholder, and what is true virtuosity? An artist's responsibility is to reframe these questions as often as possible and to do so from an unexpected perspective. Like Jeremy encountered with me when he first spoke to me about his festivals, I encountered the same resistance about the concept of disabled dancers. My work has been seen as community work, as therapeutic, with an immediate assumption that my dancers are wheelchair users. But in actuality, like a painter, I had found another color to add to my palette. But to the outside world, there were many misunderstandings, so much so that at times, just like when I first started dancing, the battle was kind of steep. There were also misunderstandings within the company, culture clashes between the disabled dancers and the non-disabled dancers. And here I was, a non-disabled choreographer, calling her show GIMP. It's amazing to me that only once was I openly questioned about this title, and this young man likened it to me calling my work the N-word. We did, ironically, get pushed back from many disability organizations who did not quite understand why we were using the word. But GIMP also aroused a curiosity that drew people to the work. It is a word we are taught not to use, just as we are taught not to look at people who look or move differently. But GIMP also is defined as fighting spirit and interwoven fabric, and it is those qualities that are at the core of the work. People often tell me that I have changed my dancers' lives, but they have changed mine. And together, we have moved out of our comfort zones, embraced 
a wider and more human aesthetic and redefine for ourselves and others what dance is. When I started dancing at the age of 20, only one person in my life supported my radical choice. He gave me this Goethe quote on this really tiny little piece of paper. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. I taped it to my bathroom mirror and read it every day. My dancers now embody this quote for me. They are powerful, they are bold, and they are magical. From the fifth graders who saw Lawrence Carter Long, a dancer with cerebral palsy, as a superhero, to those who claimed they were initially shocked seeing an aerialist without legs and a dancer with Parkinson's, but then leaving the theater awestruck by the beauty of those same dancers, there is a shift in perception. This year is the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and significant progress has and is being made. But there are so many misunderstandings as well, and they need to be addressed viscerally as only we artists can do. Why not take a moment now to consider the unexpected perspective and not see it as purely visionary, but as simply art, and to bring the magic of it into the world, just like you see now with Lisa Bufano. Thank you. Uh, please welcome me or join me in re welcoming to the stage all of, or just welcome me. <laughs> join me in welcoming all of the artists to the stage. And while you're at it, please give them a huge round of applause. Come on back up, folks, please. Uh, I will remind you that in this uh, next half hour or so, entire audience, um, if you're tweeting or using social media of any kind, the hashtag is APAPNYC. Uh, there are microphones yonder in Ober Har. Uh, so please get at them. But before you ask questions, I get at them first. Yay. Um, uh, I have a question for you um, about togetherness, the conference's theme, and um, a little bit about rule breaking. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to hear from each of you. That's me letting everybody off the hook. Do we only get 20 seconds each? But you get more than 20 seconds each. Um, what is the unwritten rule that you are most likely to uphold? or the unwritten rule in the name of togetherness? What is the unwritten rule you are most likely to uphold or the unwritten rule you are most likely to break? I'll answer that. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes. I think I'm going to answer that the way you're asking it. The, the, so. Um, there is a term that people use for the kind of abilities is um, when you think about it, it kind of says there are people there who have different abilities. Some are better than others. The unwritten rule that I have done or I've appropriated with my work is that Every single person in that studio with me has to abide by my rules. And we work really, really hard. And it's very distinction being made. So together, we're, we are actually operating under the same rigorous standard. Right. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'll say that I think political theater, but I think one, one rule that people assume is that the audience doesn't know, 
and the writer and the people on stage do know this thing. And I think that I, I flip that on its head. Show artist and the audience is my scene partner. I love them. They're in the room with me. They may all be an American. That may be an Iraqi woman. But great, we're having tea and not, so, so it, it's, it's not a history lesson. It's not a, all these things you did or should have known or this, that. it's, I'm so glad you're here. I love you. <laughs> Can I now spill my guts, you know? And I think that that, that as an energy has taken over all my work. How excited I am to have a, conversa a loving conversation with an audience about themes that are right. not being talked about. So it's the love in the room. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to have at it? Are, are, uh, have no rules. So, uh, I mean, as far as I know. <laughs> Well, actually, there is, there's one rule, which is if you know the words, you have the rules that we have and the rules that we break, I guess, have to do with, uh, with people's abilities. I, I would, you know, there's kind of an unwritten rule that everybody's got to be through it all. Just come on in, sit down, do whatever. And... Uh, the unwritten rule that, that I'm most likely to adhere to, I guess, is uh, that it's a voice. Uh, and that's the, sort of the purpose of not only doing the show, but then at the curtain call saying, everybody stick around, let's play. Awesome. <laughs> For me, the unwritten rule is, um, has, is deeply connected with commitment. If I'm committed to presenting an artist, then um, I would like the artist to be committed to saying whatever he or she would like to say. Last year, we actually presented Tanya Tagak, um, and I knew Tanya's involvement and how open she was about the things that she actually talked today. And for me, that was a good opportunity to actually be a facilitator to what she wanted to express. Mm -hmm. So the unwritten rule is that um, as long as there's commitment that whatever the artist has to say, that us as facilitators, we just you know make it happen. We give her a stage, we give her an audience, we uh, kind of like do it together, but we don't censor each other. I never asked her, what are you going to sing about? What are you going to you know perform about? And whatever image she wanted to display at that moment, whether it was gross or not, it was the, whatever way she thought was needed to be you know out there, and we just facilitated that. Uh, you can tell that there's um, immediate and deep camaraderie here, which uh, strikes me because you guys are all so epic. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you guys about intimacy and the scale of it. Um, for you, what are um, the emotional, logistical, aesthetic, curatorial elements, any one of those four or all of, or all of the above, um, what are the elements that enable you to scale intimacy? What do you mean by scale? I, what do I mean by scale intimacy? Great question. <laughs> all of you guys are so big. Um, and managed to draw us all in in a way that feels very close. I'm um, struck by the intimacy of the images that you shown, the, that you showed, Heidi, the, the closeness of one person to another, the shared breath that, sh that you talked about. So there's a, you know, you talked about, um, you know, uh, traversing several different countries, um, playing for 2,000 people, but that intimate moment of everyone standing up to saying, this land is your land, right? So um, I, I guess I'm asking you as um, creative chemists, what are the elements that you use to scale intimacy? Um, I think for me, the number one thing that occurs is vulnerability and trust. If I give my trust to the audience to accept the very, very worst parts of me and the very best mm -hmm. and hope that 
in the very hopes that they can relate. So the, the emotional capability to open to vulnerability in the face of such a harsh world mm. creates a trust after the show that gives me hope for people. It's mm. beautiful. Thank you. For me, I, I guess I would say one of the main things that creates uh, that sense of intimacy, I, I guess, is, is the music. Um, I, I did, as you said, this is a dumb little story that has a little bit of that to it. I did the Will Rogers Follies a long time ago on Broadway. I was an understudy for uh, Mac Davis, uh, who was a great guy, and uh, gave me a guitar, <coughs> which I still have. But the first time I ever went on, um, I called my mother in Texas. Well, actually, I called my father, and I said, get my mother up here because I'm <laughs> going on on Broadway. And uh, so my mother flew up and came to the show, and it was a matinee, and I went down for the, I had to come down a rope, you know, and I was scared to death, and I, and I forgot a little bit, but I did all right, I guess, and then I, I left, and they were hollering at me to take this off, put this shirt on, put the shoe over here, and then the next time I came back, I had my guitar, and my mother poked the lady next to her and said, he'll be all right now. Oh. <laughs> so that, to me, that, that it's, um, it has to do with not only what you're singing and, and what you're saying, but the, the, for me, there is a musical element to, to all of it that is, I guess, a little like choreography. It's that you, you know what's coming, but it's still a surprise. Mm. And that's, that's part of it, I guess. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, guys, I, I know that this is inherent in many of the talks that you gave, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about where you're from and specifically how um, your personal histories or your sense of place impacts your sense of accountability. Right? Like, not all of us choose to work in the context of. Um, either social justice or even global reaching. So, so how does where you're from impact what you're doing right now? Uh, for me, it very much informs what I do as an art presenter, especially presenting music, like literally from all over the world. Um, I grew up in Germany uh, to Turkish parents and um, came to the US, came to New York really in uh, 99 and I've lived in the U.S. longer than I've lived actually in Turkey or Germany. And, um, you know, just being an international person, um, being accustomed to other cultures, uh, listening to them, and especially just having sort of like um, this understanding of East meets West, especially as I was living in, in Istanbul, um, informs a lot of my, um, uh, a lot of my, my work really is based on that. I want to go into art presenting because I really truly love music from many different parts of the world, including commercial music, non-commercial music. And to be you know, in a position now to actually do this for a living while enjoying um, it so much, you know, and being in this sort of like, you know, you talked about intimacy a minute ago. You know, for me, being intimate to an artist is, it is, is an, it's an emotional relationship you set up with the artist when you commit to an event that you're producing and that you're presenting. And the thing that breaks my heart most is really when an artist has to cancel for whatever reason it may be, because I'm already so much engaged as soon as the booking happens that I want to come to, you know, to see if come to full fruition. So for me, you know, where I'm coming from um, is very much um, what I'm doing now and where I'll be going in the future. Please. Yeah, I'll, say, I'll say for myself, a, a lot has come from my own privilege, mm. Mm. because it was, it's not that I s so identified with my Iraqi roots versus my American, German, Irish roots. It was that we could have, I could have grown up there. Like it was a, the, the decision <laughs> to stay in Michigan versus go back to Iraq was just that one decision in the 70s that could have not, you know, could have gone the other way. So to have over 100 cousins in Baghdad living through various things even before this current war just it was a pr it was a it was a pressure on me for of privilege mm. but 
to answer sort of the last question within this question, I think one element of deep intimacy for me is um, the speaking of truths, but the speaking of contradictory truths. So one thing I gained from my privilege was being able to say two or 20 or 1,000 contradictory truths about Iraq and Iraqis and Iraqis' relationships with Americans and Americans, so much so that when they tried to do the play in Iraq, they had to cut over half the play. Because you cannot say that out loud, let alone on stage, and the actresses would have been, <laughs> you know, like all these horrible things, right? And it, that's when I sort of realized what a privilege I had in being able to carry what is really their story on American stages. Because it couldn't happen over there. Not yet, right? Um, you know, to, um, to take that maybe another step further, and, and my final question before I, I welcome folks to the microphone to ask your own questions. Um, you know, we learned yesterday, or we learned a couple of days ago, um, in the wake of the attacks in Paris, that the Associated Press had removed um, the image of Piss Christ from their digital archive. Um, and so I wonder about self-censorship um, and institutional, institutional self-censorship. Um, specifically, um, how do you combat the fear of saying the wrong thing? Um, and maybe relevant to folks in here, how do you work with presenters to um, urge them or nudge them out of the fear of being culturally offensive? I know. <laughs> um, but so relevant, I think, particularly now. How do we combat a culture of fear and the fear of saying the wrong thing? I've, I've come up with a solution in my shows. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> um, I've removed language. <laughs> Genius. So uh, people can interpret it whatever way they want. That's, that's it. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm totally going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a poet who radiates. Just feel my energy. Yeah. Please. Well, I, in, the, in the program about Woody Guthrie, I have the, uh, the advantage of uh, about 75% of the the script that I put together is direct quotes of Woody Guthrie. And uh, so I, I suppose I'm able to hide behind that a little bit, um, particularly with uh, some of our uh, more far-flung uh, places. When we, went, when we got ready to go to China, they asked me if the word revolution was in the script. And I said, well, uh, there's one time when it's in the lyrics of one song when it's referring to the American Revolution. And I didn't ever do anything about it. We went right ahead. But I just thought that was a very interesting question that they you know, wanted to know mm -hmm. before I got there. And uh, on the other hand, we've, we've been to uh, uh, Israel and, and to the West Bank. And, and there, and in, in some other places, I've, I've, as I say, I kind of have the advantage of, of uh, being able to say, well, this is that you have to remember the context of what Mr. Guthrie said was the 1930s and the 1940s in the United States and the drought and the Dust Bowl and the Depression and all these kinds of things. So even though it sounds exactly like he's talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict or whatever it is, he really was not. That's not what he was talking about mm -hmm. when he said, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the, you know. Yeah. You, you know, because if you get ready to, to say something or sing something like that over there, that in specific places, in Belfast and places like, you know, all kinds of things. It means something different right. in the context that they find themselves, their right. audience, and, and the, in the present. Mm. So, that's, so I, I guess that's avoiding the question. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I did with PM was, um, was take the word. And, and, and we used that word 
and embrace that word. And when, when, there, when the incident that I talked about, when somebody actually questioned me about me being non-disabled and calling my show GIMP, you know, I spoke to my dancers about it. And you know, the joy of the work that I do is that it's so collaborative. And so they said, but we decided that, Heidi. I mean, we, we took that. Um, language with uh, disabled dance, so disability in dance, is very, very tricky. And we're always redefining and figuring out what that language will be and also how to, like you were saying, entice presenters to even come and take a look at it mm. when there's such a preconceived notion of what it, what it is, even though that's often the case, it's not what they think it is. Mm. I don't really have a solution except that we just keep trying. <laughs> mm. Thank you for that. Um, guys, I'm so impressed with all of you, and I really could just keep you to myself, but that would be irresponsible, greedy, mean, and hyper-capitalist things that I don't want to do. So um, I'm wondering if any of the brilliant minds in our assembled body um, have any questions for our esteemed presenters. And if you do, if you wouldn't mind, um, there are two microphones. Um, one down this aisle right here, and one down this aisle to my left. Um, Baraka, please start us off. My question is actually for Tanya. Um, I grew up also in Michigan. I was a colored country girl raised on a chicken farm. I, you, I'm very proud of being able to say that once I was able to outride, outhunt, outshoot any man I knew. <laughs> So my question for you is, when you are hunting, my father taught me a particular ritual for hunting. Do you have a particular method or ritual for hunting? What weapons do you use when you're hunting? And do you ever sing to the animals that you hunt? Um, I'll answer them in reverse. <laughs> no singing, usually. but. Um, there were a lot of traditional ways of respecting the spirit of which animal you killed or you harvested. Like um, seals, if you melt snow in your mouth and pour it into their mouth so that their spirit isn't thirsty in the afterlife. Like where it depend where you would um, skin an animal, like you shouldn't skin a land animal on the ocean or an ocean animal on the land so you leave their spirit in the appropriate area right you it's a, it was all uh our our religions or belief beliefs were all based directly on how to respect the earth right and it's the disconnect from that that i believe has led to the destruction of the planet but uh, traditionally, we had uh, many, many different uh, inventions and ways of hunting. But typically now, it's rifle because it's so much easier. <laughs> 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 and uh, sorry, I forgot the fir very first question. What kind of weapons? Oh yeah, the, yeah. Typically, yeah, typically rifle. And it's uh, when I go home before the ice all breaks away, which typically all go, the ice goes away in July, the ocean ice that's about 10 feet thick. My, one of my favorite ways to fish is, uh, we used to grow up jumping from piece of ice to piece of ice, and we'd have a, a, a stick with a string around it, and uh, you, you're, you're jigging like this for Arctic char, and they're so close to you, like torpedoes under the water, and you pull them out. It's lovely. I'm, I'm really happy you grew up knowing where your food comes from. Right on. <laughs> My kids know that their food comes from Trader Joe's. <laughs> so. <laughs> um. Questions, <laughs> comments. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm a student at Crane School of Music, and I'm looking at this from a strictly student, very little hands-on experience kind of perspective. My question for you all is, your work is bold, and your job is to be bold. 
Um, but the audience right now is, is looking at things from kind of a place of reservation towards being pandered to. Um, how do we make them feel that they are bold too, that they can challenge themselves to be bold with you? They buy a ticket. <laughs> no, y'all go ahead. <laughs> I think that the, if, if the work is not pandering to them, then hopefully they'll rise up to that standard. Um, you're not spoon feeding anybody, then you're actually asking more of your audience. And so maybe the demands that we put on the audience has that kind of intimate mm -hmm. relationship with the audience and then uh, allows them, whether they get it or not, to hopefully rise to that place of boldness? I, th I think, um, um, yeah, can you hear me? Tanya's Hi. microphone, please. Thank you. Um, I think you, personally, as a performer, I don't really give a shit if they feel like they're being pandered to. Like, because it's up to them. I'm not going to spoon feed them a way to think. I'm just going to trust them to be open-minded, thoughtful people, and if they want to take it in, they show up at the show, and if they don't like it, there, there's the door. <laughs> Why don't audiences want something bold? Why aren't audiences out in the street demanding bold, more boldness? Because it's not safe. It's very safe. <laughs> it's safer because it's true. Mm -hmm. And once you're truthing about, <laughs> then you're in a much more reality place, and reality is safer than comatose. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of bold audiences yeah. in America in groups of card-carrying Republicans, you know? So, I mean, with my work, that's interesting, right? You know, so it's, I, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of bold audiences, but I do wonder why we don't, we're not absolutely demanding at all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if, if, well, I won't interject, um, please. <laughs> there was someone over here? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Okay, hi. First, let me congratulate APAP for this convening. It's very exciting. And, and as a disabled woman, I, I need to acknowledge that uh, the inclusion of physically integrated dance and the idea of disability as a social, cultural, and political as something that has social and cultural and political meaning within the context of what you're all talking about is very exciting. And um, Heidi, I, I know because I know you and have traced, <laughs> traced this with you, how has it been to uh, not only convince presenters to take the work seriously and not to dismiss it as therapeutic work for the benefit of those poor disabled dancers who finally get give the chance to be on stage, but rather as exciting work. How has it been to convince them that this has cultural meaning beyond what is happening there on stage, but is happening, as you're all talking about, in interaction with the audience? What is, uh, you know, that's been a challenge for you. Can it you has, and I don't know that I have. I think there's some presenters who have um, brought us in and then have also wanted me to do community engagement and post-performance talkbacks and conversations and bringing the disability community um, into that residency. And then there are some presenters who they just, you know, want the dance for what it is. That's rarer because I think that the presenters who are open to this kind of work, they want to engage community on a wider scale. They, they see that there is something more than just a da another dance performance, that it, it, it is 
entity, mm -hmm. that it has those ramifications and that perhaps can create a difference or more dialogue within their communities. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Please, here. My question's for David. I'm an early boomer who grew up singing the songs of Woody Guthrie and the other then contemporary songwriters who created songs that we all sang on the streets as we were protesting a war and urging change in public policy. And my kids' generation and my grandkids' generation don't have songs like that. They're not creating songs these days. And I'm wondering if you've had any conversations with your audiences as you travel talking about or asking and finding even songs that might be more, uh, that are contemporary and that are addressing issues of today? That's a very good question. And I've, I've, people ask that question quite often, is who is the Woody Guthrie of today? And the, the, shorter an the short answer is that I really don't know. Uh, the longer answer is that I think that there are plenty of Woody Guthrie's today. Um, I, as Alicia can tell you, I'm not much of an internet uh, person. Um, but I do know that it exists. And, <laughs> and I, I can tell you that, that what, one of the main differences between uh, now and then is that then uh, there were a lot of people out there singing uh, protest songs like Woody Guthrie and songs that had to do with specific situations or specific injustices or specific events. And they, their outlet was either a barn dance or, or a church or the radio. And Woody was luck enough, lucky enough to make it to the radio and became relatively popular before he was blacklisted and all that other kind of stuff. A lot of people knew who he was relatively speaking. But I think now that with the proliferation of, of uh, the, the interweb net, um, <laughs> that, uh, that there are thousands of people who write and try to observe uh, in the same way. But because there is so much of it, it's very, very difficult to find the people who are skilled and creative and they, they still exist and they're still there and they're, and they're uh, one of the main comparisons that people often make is with rap music uh, which uh, quite often has to do with uh, with social issues uh, today but even that of course as, as even I know uh, kind of gets diluted uh, away with there's so much uh, rap music and and uh, that has to do with other things that are that are not so uh, pop. You know, people don't want to hear about um, that. A lot of very creative stuff gets buried underneath. So I think it just has to do with uh, the different methods of communication. That that Woody was a, was a lucky fellow who who did a great job and and people realized it. And today there are still people doing a great job. It's just harder to find them. Do you remember the shaming of the Dixie Chicks in 2003? So, so perhaps um, the question is, why don't more of us galvanize towards the edge? No, it's more, why aren't we all singing? Right, right. If we don't have songs that are getting all of us to sing together because that singing together empowered us. Right. Hmm. We're well, singing that's, happy. That's, maybe. That's a great <laughs> point. You know, and true. when I, every time I have a hootenanny, uh, I try to, uh, to sing the songs that, that everybody can sing. That's, that's sort of my uh, raison d'etre. And, uh, and as you properly point out, an awful lot of those songs are, are pre-1960. Um, but they still exist. And they're, but music and, and the audience's ability to discern and all of those things, they, they are living things as well, and, and cultural, uh, um, what shall I say, um, approaches or, or the, the aim of, of the, the, to get with the rifles here, of the, the where everybody wants to go mm. uh, is more fractured, I believe, today. Thank you.
put it in took the music of a rap artist and put it into Selma so that the next, the previous generation and the next generation are listening to each other's films and each other's music. That's what we're not doing. How about we pick up that music and listen to it and sing along to what young people are recording today? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Hi guys. Heidi, it's Melissa Riker. Congratulations on everything. Um, a quick about the bravery and the boldness of our audiences. There's something that I learned and perhaps you guys can speak to this. I had an audience member come to a show where the first half of the show is very dancey. In the second half of the show, we ask the audience to be very brave with us. And there was one man in the audience who said, if I had known this was interactive, I wouldn't have come, but I'm so glad I'm here. Hmm. And I feel like that speaks to that question of bravery, that they're way more brave than we give them credit for. They're, they're even bolder and braver than they know. Hmm. And I wonder if you can speak to that a little bit. Me? Me? <laughs> it's for Anyone? everybody. <laughs> you. Um, I thought it was for everybody. It um, is. Well, I, I have to say that we have a lot of post-performance talkbacks after our shows. And I would say that in general, I'm more impressed with the audience than not impressed. And we've had incredible discussions. And um, there seems to be that kind of boldness. I mean, what we get sometimes, which I have to fix right away, is, oh, your dancers are so brave. And that's not our point, right? They're not so brave. They're professional dancers dancing in my company. But that's a perception that we get from the audience. And then we have to reflect it back in a different way. That's specific to my world right now. Um, I have to say, I'd probably be one of those audience members who would say, oh, I don't want to be in an interactive show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand that. But I, I think what we were talking about before is that the more we stay true to our vision and, what, and be bold with that, that we are asking the audience then to come along for the ride. Whether they buy the tickets and actually come to the show, that's a whole other thing. Like, how do you get them in? So one of the things we're trying to do is, because of the ADA celebration in July, we're going to be all over New York City, outside, in public spaces, so that people don't have to buy a ticket to see an unconventional body moving. You know, you know can we do more of that to encourage other people to see that what we're doing maybe is not so scary. Thank you. Um, we are at time. Um, please join me in <laughs> affirming this really incredible battery of thinkers, culture makers, visionaries and experts in togetherness in bringing people together. Thank you for moving our world forward. Um, I'd like to welcome back Daniel and Rachel to the stage. Thank you, guys. Oh, please, please stay, please stay. Because again, I want us all together to thank you, Mark, and thank each of you speakers. I am from California, so I just have to say, awesome. It was just awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for a thoughtful and inspiring session. And thanks to you all for coming and for your participation. Thank you so much. David? And I want to echo that. Please give them another hand. They were so wonderful, so innovative. Uh, tomorrow's plenary is with Ira Glass, so you don't want to miss that. Please be here at 11 o'clock. Um, right now, please go to the bathroom, get something to eat, get something to drink, call your mom, your dad, your children. And the Expo Hall is open at 2 o'clock. See you there. Thank you.